what was the reason that you became, uh, that you studied medicine? And the circumstance was that the war was coming and we were refugees in, in Britain and we had, we were just being naturalized and become British and my father said to me, uh, why don't you study medicine like my father did, his father, then you will not have to kill people in the war and you are less likely to be killed yourself. And both these reasons I thought were good reasons <laughs> for studying medicine. Uh, I knew from bef long before that I couldn't follow him into physics because I wasn't, I was either too stupid or too unmathematical. And uh, so that had lost its appeal. But I was always interested in biological things and processes. And so that was the main impulse to do medicine. And of course, I'm very glad that I did for the two reasons that he gave and also for it became a very interesting life because I did, after studying medicine, I did practical medicine only quite, <coughs> quite a short while and then went into research after the war. But in the war I was a practical doctor. How was that? It was near uh, Hiroshima, as I know. I was called up into the army <coughs> as a doctor <coughs> and uh, almost immediately was sent to the Far East and I spent the whole of the war in the Far East, first in India, briefly in Burma, uh, then on a ship that was evacuating um, wounded people from Chittagong to Ceylon, and then I was posted to uh, Pune near Bombay, and then the atom bombs were dropped on the 6th of August 1945, and the other one three or four days later, and it ended the war, and then the British invasion force for Japan was turned into the occupation force, and I was a member of that, about, I forget now, about 100,000 people, and we went to Japan later that year, about uh, end of October, November, and I was, uh, the main host British hospital, uh, was quite near Hiroshima on the Inland Sea and uh, we, we and three of our other medical professors or doctors there were the first British people to go to Hiroshima quite, uh, I mean, three or four months after it was destroyed. And that uh, left an impression that has, of course, never left me. Your father is a physicist uh, was aware of the activities in Germany uh, and with the Allies in particular in the US to build an atomic bomb. Uh, did he anticipate the consequences of such weapons? Was that a topic that he discussed with you at home? Yes, he, he, uh, he wanted from the beginning nothing to do with this. And he, when in 1942, I suppose, no, 1941, Bohr was flown in a mosquito bomber from Sweden, where he had taken refuge, to London uh, on his way to America. And my father sent me to Bohr with a letter. Uh, I'd been in Edinburgh and I came to London and of all sorts of other things. And Bohr and his son were staying in a, a hotel just by Buckingham Palace, mm -hmm. Buckingham Gate, under, under a false name. And so I went in and Bohr was lying down, he was very tired, and I met Olga Bohr, the son who later got an and uh, I gave him this letter, and in this letter my father said he wanted, he himself would have nothing to do with the development of an, any atomic weapons. Um, and Bohr, of course, was on his way to Los Alamos. During the preparation for this interview, we had several phone calls and there you mentioned that Göttingen you still consider to be your home, your hometown. What does this mean to you? Can you uh, explain this to us, please? Uh, I, I remember in, in the Plankstrasse the beauty of the house and we had the bottom flat with a big music room mm -hmm. and my father 
alone or with Heisenberg very often, who was a very good pianist, played the piano, piano either himself or with two things, the Heisenberg and Schubert for, two, for four hands and for two pianos and so on and so forth. And I used to lie under the piano and it came down from above and it was quite wonderful. And, you know, and far too few children have that experience, I think, now. How did family life happen in the Bourne family at the time? He, he was a, a very warm man and our house was full of his co-workers. <clears throat> I remember Heisenberg, for example, sitting with him at the desk uh, day after day after day for a very long time. And later some other people, Hund and, um, you know, and Weisskopf was there and so on. And, uh, I remember all of them very well. My, they, we had a very open house. My parents had them in and out and uh, gave parties and people came and stayed for dinner uh, all the time. Uh, what was the secret of Göttingen? What was so attractive? Why did they all come to visit Göttingen and to work with your father? My father brought Frank there and he was leading the leading experimenter in his field and um, I imagine that um, from 1921 on when my father was there the constellation of these three very good people from Kupol and Born was very attractive and then um, when Bohr came to give his lectures and 1922, I think, um, the basis of investigation of quantum theory spread to Göttingen. And wasn't my father the first person to use the word quantum mechanic? Mm -hmm. I think yes. he was. Yes. So he, th that was obviously the, the, a, a major attraction during the 1920s to 1933, the phase that we now call a golden decade, your father, his colleagues uh, and his students uh, performed research at a very high level, which uh, to us now defines a revolution uh, in science. Do you think they were fully aware of what they were doing? And could you explain the spirit, the spirit of Göttingen in those days, please? was apparently very stimulating to them all. And I remember him saying, and that is also in, his, in the book, that when they had the weekly seminars with Hilbert and the, and the Frank and the young people and Paul and so on, that Hilbert said at the opening remark every time, na ja, was ist denn Atom eigentlich, you know? Uh, and so that in other words, they were like we were later in our lab in, in the, the College of Surgeons. Uh, it was a tremendously ex mentally exciting time, and they knew that with with Heisenberg's discovery and my father's matrix addition and all that, that it was uh, uh, something very new. I think they were all aware of that. Your father was PhD advisor of several scientists who we now consider to be great physicists and they are very famous. But you know them also personally and I was wondering if you can tell us some stories about them, about their uh, characters, uh, how they were, how you experienced them, maybe also at home. Maybe we start with Maria Göppert Meyer. But she was very warm. Mm -hmm. uh, very warm. The father had been a doctor, was a medic, was a physician. Um, very outgoing, very friendly, uh, full of fun. And uh, it's very strange. You remember what happened to her later? Mm -hmm. She married uh, Joe Meyer, and who was an American, came to Göttingen, went to America, did her brilliant work, got a Nobel Prize in the early 60s. But she took to drink. They had two children with who were problems. You probably know the story. And so that was very sad. I didn't realize. I couldn't have imagined that, starting with this person I knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and you must remember that I knew, I knew I was a child at the time. I knew a number of them when they came to visit my father in Cambridge later, mm -hmm. like Heisenberg and so on. But Maria never, I never, 
saw again. Then let's continue with Viktor Weiskopf. He was also a PhD student of your father. He was a great favorite of the whole families, but because he was very bubbly and spontaneous. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then Robert Oppenheimer was well, also that's a PhD a, student of your that's father. A, yes, that's a story in itself. I can't tell you the interesting things about him. Uh, he, was, he was rather the opposite. He was quite reserved. Um, somewhat well, a bit rigid, slightly formal, and you know the famous story that is in the book about uh, him always being uh, fallout in the seminars. Mm -hmm. You know that mm -hmm. story, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, that that sort of describes him. I didn't know him well. I mean, I, he was one of the people who went in and out. So now I'd like to touch on a somewhat sensitive topic, which is the relationship between your father and Werner Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg received the Nobel Prize in Physics in the 30s for work that he had done in very close collaboration with your father, who in turn received it much later, only in the 50s. Also, your father was not involved in any uh, atomic bomb activities, while uh, Werner Heisenberg was. It was a kind of father-clever-son relationship in the Göttingen time. Mm -hmm. um, and that, can, that is all documented by my father in his writings and to some extent in Heisenberg. So at that time, then came the war and Heisenberg is, was in this very difficult position indeed. And I, I have great sympathy for him. You know, he was a patriotic German, but he didn't probably like that particular government and um, it was very difficult for him and you know throughout the time uh, the Germans didn't get anywhere anyway he he miscalculated the critical mass I believe by a pretty large factor and so and then after the war my, my father um, didn't think that he would be he knew he was a patriotic German, but he had great doubts about whether they would come up with an atomic weapon. And um, th throughout, he wasn't really frightened of that. And after the war, they met in our house first again in 1947, when Heisenberg uh, came to Edinburgh. And um, uh, the old relationship, my father was of course much more reticent and wary than he had been before, but the the good relationship persisted simply because they they, they achtet sich gegenseitig. Wie sagt man das auf Englisch? I don't know. So now I'd like to move on on to a, a question which also contains some sad moments uh, and moments that we are not so proud of uh, in Göttingen. Uh, that is the moment that you and your family left. If I'm not mistaken, you were alone with your parents, your sisters were in south of Germany. Uh, what exactly happened and how did you move from Göttingen uh, uh, via various other places to Cambridge and later to Edinburgh? My father was not dismissed, but he was beurlaubt by the Nazi government on the 1st of April, was it, I mm. think. Uh, when the general anti-Jewish law came into force. He was urlaubt, he was put on leave. The salary was sustained. My par but he was stopped, he, he, all his teaching was stopped. He wasn't allowed to teach. So he couldn't go to the institute. And my parents, of course, thought day and night about what to do. And, um, Einstein, with whom he was already a close friend, who was in Belgium at the time, said, leave at once, go at once, and so did various other people. Uh, my parents were friendly with Professor Meyer in Zurich, uh, who close friends with Professor Experimental Physics in Zurich, who also said, go at once, and so did most people. Uh, and so they packed up the house, <clears throat> and we had, they had taken um, an apartment in the South Tyrol in the Val Gardena uh, for the summer holidays, 
they wrote to these people, could they come now? And so they said yes. And on I think on the 10th of May it was, or some early day in May, uh, we got in the train in Göttingen, and the three of us, my my daughter, my sisters were in Salem at school, mm -hmm. and um, left for Zitol, for South Tyrol. And I remember one incident that is recorded by my mother too, that at some station on the way south, some book burning went on, I've forgotten where. And my father was so furious, he wanted to get off the train and scream at these people, but my mother held him back. And uh, thank God. Mm. And um, so uh, we went to uh, this apartment in the house uh, in Wolkenstein, uh, Selva, Valkadena, uh, for the whole of the summer. Uh, and um, it was a sort of, you know, exciting trip for me. I was a boy of 11. Mm. 